go to and put those numbers in, and that's okay. I didn't get an overwhelming response anyway. Um, yeah, it's an important, you know, I, I, you know, I'm going, hopefully with you guys' help and whatever, uh, this guy's been really uh, talkative. He's been opening up a lot of light. The, the other day, uh, Tina and I were chatting. I wound up, within the last three days, putting together the framework of three books. Uh, just like what I'm, I'm sitting on the porch and like automatic writing. I just can't stop I'm writing, writing, writing. Hey, Amen. Yeah. yeah. And one of the books will be The Things God Can't Do. And why he doesn't, why he can't heal sometimes, that, that, that's a big question in Christian spines. And I think it really hasn't been uh, given a fair treatment with the balance of scriptures from A to Z, looking at all aspects of it. And it has a lot to do with patterns. It has a lot to do with uh, one of the things that we will be looking at tonight, which is God puts character above Charisma. Isn't that an interesting statement? You told me that today. Character is much more important to God than charisma. That's why a lot of what goes on in our lives takes a long time, guys. Yeah. I was, last night I couldn't sleep, but I was, you know, I was studying and I was listening and I was texting and doing all kinds of things. And then it came to my mind, uh, somebody was mentioning that, you know, a lot, there's a lot of people today in a half an hour, they get an apostle certificate, they get a pastor's license and you get all these, everything is quick on the internet. You know, I, I'm a minister, you know, so, and yep, yep. so one guy was saying, geez, you know, God has been really restoring my soul for 40 years, which is basically obliterating the old man. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, so I said, you know, it's got to be close to that for me. I said, you know, what? God said, do the math, John. And I got saved in 1975 at 25 years old. And uh, my birth into ministry after my devastating depression in 2007 when God said just let me love you and began teaching me all these wonderful things the, the he's teaching me he began saying you know he's he, he told me what you know and we're gonna look at that what, what he told Job uh, we gonna look at that remember at near the end where Job submits himself to the Lord I am dust oh, yeah. right yeah, and uh, if you guys, the book of Job is very tedious. It takes 42 chapters before Job <laughs> becomes Job. Hey, guys, I'm going to tell you something. Abraham made a lot of mistakes. We call him the father of faith. Yeah. But he was 100 years old when he submitted to God to have Jacob. Not Jake, I'm sorry. Isaac, Itzhak, okay, Itzhak, which means laughter. You know, they both laughed at the possibility. It took 90 years with Yaakov, jo Jacob. You know, Jacob's name, Yaakov, means supplanter, heel grabber, right, and usurper. He had a name... His name, you know, in the Bible, your name is very much your, your character. character. Yeah. Character. And Jacob was chosen. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was in the pattern. Okay. He was in the prophecy. He was in the lineage. But he didn't have the character. But with his, you know, propensity to get stuff for himself through his own talent. He was a con man. 
Jacob was a con man. And him and his mother conned Yitzhak, the father, who was getting blind and old. You remember? And he stole the birthright, right? From, you know, from each other. brother. Mm-hmm. And that was an act of lying and stealing. But because it was for the birthright, God continued to bless him. You see, when we fight for the things of God, he blesses us. But his character was wrong. So you know the story with with this conniver. He, you know, now his brother, who is a surly beast, wants to kill him. He's got to leave town. So he goes out and winds up hanging out with his uncle Laban. Laban happens to be a bigger con man than Jacob. And so he wants to marry Rachel, remember? He says, hey, work seven years. You'll have her. Boom. Seven years goes by. He slips Leah in the tent. Good morning. I married the Leah. Well, how many people know that Leah was responsible for ten of the tribes of Israel? And Rachel only had two. Ten represents the law, you know, and two represents grace. Ten represents Israel, two represents Judah. Ten represents the mind. The ten tribes, after Solomon's reign, they were split up. The ten tribes went north. And what remained was Judah. Okay, that was the two. And guess what happens to most Christians? Ten out of the twelve aspects of God go north, and that means it goes into their head. And God has got to bring Israel back from their head to their heart. Not head knowledge, but heart knowledge. Open the eyes of my heart. Give me ears of understanding. You see? So... Now Jacob goes seven years, he marries Rachel, his love, okay? But then he, he gets in, he keeps getting conned, and now he's got to leave and he's got to do something. How many people know, if you can weigh in, how many people know he, he's, he's going to split up from Laban, and Laban is smart, okay? And they, they're working a deal with the sheep and the goats, because that's what he's been doing all these years. And Laban outfoxes him because he because Jacob says, well, I'm going to take the speckled one, whatever it was. So Laban goes through and he takes all the speckled ones all, and, and he moves them out. And, and, he's, and Laban is trying to con Jacob so that he, he you know, they won't reproduce speckled. Then Jacob's going to walk away with... Uh, Pure. Said a hundred. How many people know what what Jacob did, guys? Who knows? Uh, I'm, I'm giving you a chance. If you don't know, it's okay. Jacob, he put, what, some, some sticks or something. Yeah, he makes sticks. He makes sticks. Right. right. And the fences. I just he makes on sticks on. And, and and what they call panels. He makes a spotted. Environment for them. The sheep and the goats are looking at this speckled environment and they start producing speckled children. And this is the principle. Guys, this is the principle for tonight. Here's the principle what you look at, you become. Wow. It's a law in the spirit. It's a law in quantum mechanics. It's been proven scientifically that what you look at, you become. That's why it's so important, so important to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Some people that I join on every Thursday with a group. 
John, can and I add to that? What I focus on gets bigger. Well, yeah. Amen. Amen. That's it. Somebody, somebody, can somebody open up, uh, open up their Bible to Colossians three and read the first? I think it's three verses. That you guys involved? Unless I can read it, but if you can find it. I don't want to go to it. Uh, while you're going there, let's look at Job 42. Or somebody's finding Colossians 3. Want to brush your teeth? So Job, you brush your teeth? So, so Jacob was 90 years old. Somebody, excuse me. Somebody needs to mute. If you don't want uh, to help Trish, me. I think you're, you need to mute, Trish. We're hearing your no. conversation. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Nobody told me. Um. I, I wasn't you got to look at the icon. You got to look at the microphone. It's either green or red. Yes. You got to keep it red. Thank you. Thank you. Trish is just calling in. She's not on. So just, yeah, um, let's just call. Trish, just I had mute trouble phone. logging in through the. Trish, I will. I just wanted to say hi to everybody. I'm muting now. Okay. All right. Thank you. So here's Job. Okay. We'll finish with that. Then we'll read Colossians. You know, God opens the book of Job, and he's bragging to the enemy, Satan, adversary Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? None like him, faithful in all his ways. And, 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 and Satan has been observing Job, and, and he doesn't, that, that report doesn't, doesn't sit right with Satan. Now, when God brings you up to Satan, how how are you looking? Mm -hmm. Oh, he's got me in court. How are you looking? M making his petition. And, and, and Satan said, you know, oh, you put a hedge around him, and, and uh, you know, if you do this, take that away, and then ultimately, you know, he he, he covers his whole body with boils, because then Satan says, well, I'll tell you what, he, he didn't go for that temptation, but you know what, if you touch his body, and, and, and the thing is, is that if you read the book of Job, Job is not loving this hardship. God is making character, and Job doesn't understand it. And at one point, and I've been there because I used to call myself the president of God's complaint department. <laughs> because Job says, you know what, if you were a man, come down, I'll fight with you. And... As somebody that lost their 19-year-old daughter in 2002 and my wife three years later, 2005, and then my sanity and I lost God in 2007. You know, I said to God, I read the book of Job, Lord. I wasn't too impressed with Job from the beginning. I said, what, 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 what the heck are you talking about? It's done like him. And God said to me something I never, I know it's in my Job book that I wrote with Ed Miller. I have never seen anybody see it. God said to me, John, I wasn't talking about Job in the beginning of the book. I, I'm talking about Job at the end of the book. And I went, boom. What? He says, I see the end from the beginning. He said, when I spoke to Adam, I saw you, John. I see everything at the same time. I'm going, whoa. He said, I tricked Satan into making Job the man he wanted to be. And guess what? When he told me before my wife passed in 2004, when I was crying in the bathroom in a shower, thinking about her imminent death, or was, was this thing going to be healed, the lumps, the, the foma? He indicated to me he didn't cause it, but he said one of the most profound things he's ever said to me, I won't waste your pain. See, God, God, and this will be in this other book, but God will bypass the prayer of the moment. This you got to get. This is from Med Miller. God will bypass 
the prayer of the moment to answer the prayer of a lifetime. He knew from the time Amen. I was a child. But when I first got saved, I said, who can I follow God? Who's a man of God? Who is walking in this stuff? I don't see it. There's no models. I don't see a man of God that's taking this scripture seriously. Only Jesus. And I must have said to him, stupidly, smack me when you see me, guys. I want to be that man. You know what? God answers the prayer of a lifetime to be conformed to the image of Christ. And if you've got to lose an eye, a leg, a lung, it's okay with God. Jesus said it. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. It's better to enter into heaven in pieces. Think be 100% perfect and go into Gehenna. Death. So Job got tricked into becoming Job. So when, when finally, and God never answers, listen to this. You say, God, will you answer my questions? Well, I'll tell you what. He never answered not a one of Job's. <laughs> and finally in 42, when Job listens to a hundred questions asked of him by God, <laughs> basically showing Job, Reality. You know what saves you from bad patterns, from false presumptions and traditions? Reality. I'm God, you're dust. Me, Tarzan, you, Jane. I'm Jesus, you're the woman at the well. You had five husbands, the one you're with now, you're not married to. Stop talking about your worship. Stop talking about your rights as a Samaritan. You're a sinner. And I'm calling you out. So finally, Job is just, you see, you don't surrender to God. You sur are surrendered. Surrendered. By a vision of God as John was in Revelation chapter 1. When he saw the resurrected Christ, he fell at Jesus' feet as a dead man. That's surrendered. When you surrender, it'll last as long as your last New Year's resolution. It'll last as long as your good mood in the Lord. God knows our hearts, desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. So now Job submits himself to the Lord, and Job replies, I know that you can do all things, and that no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this who conceals my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Too many Christians speak of things according to their own understanding. Things far, I'm going to add, far too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall inform me. Now hear this, guys. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I retract my words. That's repentance. Retract your questions and your prayers. And I repent in dust and ashes. And now you're in Romans chapter 6. If you died with Christ, you'll rise to an entirely new life with him. If you've joined him, 
in death. Let's see. Death to self, John? Death to self? Death to your partial understanding and knowledge. Because there are two wings on a bird and he can't fly without it. One time I had a vision many years ago, reminding me of when we were in Italy. I saw, in the vision, there was a courtyard full of pigeons. And half of them had, they all had one wing. Half had a left wing and half had a right wing. And God said to me, you need two wings, John. That's why there's only two great commandments that Jesus spoke. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And the second is like unto it. It's a matching wing. Love your neighbor as yourself. There are many couplets, and a lot of times we have one wing and not two. So I have faith. I have faith in God. But you got so much faith in your own understanding that it nullifies, nullifies that wing. Philippians tell us that we are the circumcision, the true circumcision of God. What is circumcision? Circumcision in the New Testament, according to Paul, is the removal of the foreskin on your heart. Open the eyes of their heart so that you can get in touch with the Christ God put in you at birth and before the foundation of the world you were in him. The light of God is in every person. The gospel is in every person. If that's not true, then God is a liar and God is unfair because if, you, if these people don't know, didn't have the capacity, then God, it would be the same as if God was blaming a blind man for not seeing. You can't fault a blind man for not seeing. You can't fault a deaf man for not hearing. If God can judge faithlessness, then there was faith there. We just won't submit to it we won't agree to it and our job as ministers of jesus christ is to remove those blockages for people take the burdens off them get rid of these false presumptions traditions that block the knowledge of god second corinthians we're going to touch on we'll get there but i, I want to first go to genesis 1 now keep in mind what we just said with job and I'm just going to kind of riff here. You guys don't mind. I got so much stuff. It'd take 10 years to share it. But uh, Genesis 1. Okay. God creates the heaven and the earth. Right. One day, if you're interested, I'll do a presentation on the first seven words in the scripture. I will show you patterns that you will fall on the floor. God does a mathematical miracle with those seven words. I can't even begin to show you. I have to create the presentation for you. But what I want to show you is, and God said, let there be light. Ah, he, or in Hebrew, it adds up to 232. And it's the number of my address in Jersey. And God told me it's no coincidence. I've got two pages of 232 notes. That's another pattern. But God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, who said, who, who sees that God said it? What happens in verse 4, guys? God saw that the light was good, tov in Hebrew. When God, God speaks something, it exists. The reality doesn't happen until he sees it. 
And when he sees it, he pronounces it good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. Lila. Delilah means of the night. Samson is Shemesh, means sun. Samson was the sun. And Delilah was the dark. You see, what did we just see with Job, guys? Job said, I had heard you. So God speaks, Debar, which means the doorway of the sun in Hebrew letters, Debar. Okay. God speaks, but he, when he sees it, he pronounces it's good. And then he separates it. Okay. And God blesses and separates. And that's what we call holiness. Holiness is being separated unto the work of God, into the, the purposes of God. Okay. Let there be light. So what I want to go to, oh, let's see. Um, oh, I can't make it out now. Uh, John, I'm getting a little confused about where you're going with this. Yeah. I'm like getting real caught up in what you're saying and not really connecting it. Okay. Okay. Well, what we're Can you circle back and just summarize yeah. right. why you, so what we're you were talking? Is, you were talking. You look at some, we look at something. I want to go to. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm trying to, to set up the premise that. What we look at, we become. And what we're trying to see is addictive patterns. And nobody got Colossians 3, by the way. Did you get Colossians 3, anybody? To read? I do, if no one else does, wants to read it. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, and it's interesting because I have a note in my Bible, because I'm not looking online, about um, extreme addiction punishment of ourselves. Uh, for example, like in someone cutting themselves. Um, and that's what you're talking about, what you're focusing on in addiction. Um, right. So it's, you, it says, um, since then, you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's the first three. three. That's what I, yeah, and that was a scripture God gave me a few, I don't know, last week, whatever it was, and he's been very, very stern about me not, and I'm not saying for anything for you to do, but for me to really limit the news and what I'm looking at and what I'm listening to. And he's asking me to trust him. And it's much better for me because I have a fear-based personality. And fear is hatched in your imagination. Okay. And that light is darkness. We're going to get to that. Okay. When the light inside of you is darkness, we know that Jesus said that, right? Yeah. He said, what, you know, he said, uh, the, he said, the eye is the lamp, right, of the body. If your eye is single, your whole body is full of light. He says, but what if the light in you is darkness? How dark is that darkness? We can let in dark light. And it consumes us with negativity and fear. And we wind up in patterns like Job was in a pattern. You see, Jacob was in a pattern. This is what I want to bring out to you. We, Jacob was in a pattern of being deceptive, of conniving, of trying to get through his earthly talents, spiritual blessings. 
That's witchcraft, guys. That's trying to manipulate the environment. And there's, as you guys know, I've said it over and over again, there's only two sources. This is simple stuff. You only have to look for two sources. What's creating the pattern in you? It's either fear or love. Or love. And that's where many times we see we're so manipulative. We have presumptions, we have all these things that are born out of fear. We have it anytime we feel any ounce, little push from fear, we have a knee jerk reaction to, to control. Yes. Because fear has to do with punishment, abandonment, isolation, hiding. We have to control the feelings. Fear has torment, it says in, in, in 1 John. But love is acceptance. It's a sacrifice of one for another. It's family, it's unity, it's union, it's safety, it's bliss. So I was reading this morning, and we're going to look at John chapter 8 as as really, we're still introducing it. We don't have to get anywhere. We're trying to make a simple point of what we look at. Always remember that. That's the direction, Catherine. So Jesus, right after, remember he had the incident with the woman caught in adultery, and he starts writing in the sand? And I don't have time to go into that, but that is the fulfillment of a prophecy in Jeremiah uh, and that explains it, but we don't have time to get into it. So the Pharisees do that. And they weren't going to open their mouths. Okay. He, he who casts. Therefore, yeah, Jesus. Right. So, so Jesus says, go away. Where are your accusers? He said, no one, sir. And he goes, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more from now on. Okay. That's another thing. We'll talk about that when we talk about healing. So therefore, Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. The one following me shall not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, let me tell you something. Following Jesus isn't talking necessarily. Is The enemy doesn't care what you're saying. And most of the time, God does. And he listens to your heart. You drive him crazy if you listen to everything coming out of your mouth. <laughs> that may not be biblical, but I think it is. I mean, Jesus got annoyed. <laughs> Nobody came down from the mountain. How long are going to be with these people? Um, I'm the light of the world. I'm going to tell you something about your patterns. The enemy, we talked about this the first time, he wants you in a tight pattern of destruction. He wants you relying on doing something over and over again, trying to have an effect on your life. It's not inspired by God. Therefore, the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness concerning yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus said, even if I am bearing witness concerning myself, my testimony is true because I know from where I came and where I'm going. But you do not know from where I come and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. Here's the pattern. I'm judging no one. But even if I do judge, my judgment's true. Because I'm not alone. But I and the Father having sent me. Remember what I spoke of as the Son of Man mentality. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus who lowered himself, humbled himself. And remember what we read? We read in John chapter 5 last week. Jesus never did anything without agreeing with his Father. How is it that we as Christians do that? We are better than Jesus because we got a King James Bible and he didn't? But also in your law, it has been written. 17, that the testimony of two men is true, takes two. I am one bearing witness concerning myself, and the Father, having sent me, bears witness concerning me. Then they say, where's your Father? Jesus answered, you 
know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. That's the key, guys. In this reality, the Father has made Jesus Christ preeminent in the Godhead. He spoke these words in the treasuries, teaching in the temple, and no one sees them, for his hour had not yet come. We could talk about that, but we don't have time. No one's going to seize you if your hour has not yet come. And he said, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you're not able to come. Therefore, the Jews were saying, will he kill himself? See, this is the, this is the presumptions. This is the interpretation without inspiration. Jesus said to them, you're from below. I'm from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Therefore, they were saying to him, who are you? <laughs> Just what I am saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say. And to judge concerning you. But the one having sent me is true. And what I have heard from him. These things I say to the world. I want that to be true of you guys and me. The one having sent us is true. And what I heard from him. These things I say to the world. They did not understand that he was speaking to them about the Father. See, all this confusion about the Father. Today, the Christians are confused about the Father. This is the age where the Father and the sons, who knows the prophecy in Malachi in the last days, will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the Father. That's our job. We have the Elijah task right now. We are John the Baptist, preparing the way for the second coming. As he came the first time, we're preparing. And the way we do that is turning the hearts of the children to the Father. Did you notice when they, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray, Lord. He didn't teach them, oh, Jesus. He taught them our Father. When you shall have lifted up the Son of Man. I remember, there's another Son of Man thing. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And I do nothing from myself. I do nothing from myself. But as the Father taught me, I speak these things. And the one having sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do the things pleasing to him. Boy, Christianity is getting simpler, isn't it, by the moment? <laughs> now we see this. The truth will set you free. I want you, you know, my, my favorite sign in the healing rooms back in the day when I did a lot of that stuff. I got to get one made up. I think. Catherine might have made it for me. Uh, the saying is, the truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. <laughs> is a truth. That's Write that down. So, of his speaking these things, many believed in him. Therefore, Jesus was saying to the Jews, having believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered unto him, We're Abraham's seed. And to no one ever have we been under bondage. Uh, Egypt, uh, Rome, uh, Babylon, uh, what? Well, they forgot that. Details, you know. 
Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you that everyone practicing the sin is a slave of the sin. Now the slave does not abide in the house to the age. The son abides to the age. So if the son shall set you free, you'll be free indeed. So what we see here, and we'll stop there, is that anyone, and, and this is a different translation, but in some of the translations, do you guys have it? I don't know if you have it or not. But anyone who's in sin is a slave to sin. Also, it also means is in prison to sin. It's imprisoned by sin, right? And so we want to talk about, I mean, I've been there. You guys been in prison to sin? Been in something that's hard to break for years and for whatever, you know, secret stuff. Addiction. Yeah. The AA, uh, nobody says it better than AA. You're only as sick as your secrets. And so, when, when Jesus is talking about light and love, right, and the release and the truth, and, and I'm facetiously saying it'll make you miserable, but that's there's a great truth there. Because Can I add say, something? John? Yeah. 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 So uh, I think that, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know, but one thing that God has shown me is that he will actually show me a pattern over and over again. It may take me 20 years to see it, but it keeps on repeating back until I get it. Whether it's sin or it's a predicament or situation or you know, some kind of crazy pattern. So I'm very happy to see when these destructive patterns are in front of me. It's a really bad connection. Uh, Okay. Uh, there's there's a lot of noise. Yeah. Around. And so, uh, what we what, you know we've come to understand you know, and we can look at. I'm trying to see which is the best scripture to go to next. Uh, we can look at. Uh, we can look at, uh, like I said, we, we looked at the principle of Jacob and the sheep and becoming what they look at. We can look at 1 John 3, 2, if we can find it. Let me see. Uh, uh, let me go here. Let me go here. Uh, how many guys uh, out there, how many guys use this Bible Hub? Bible dot, Biblehub.com? I do. Does anybody use that? I no, I'll write it down. It's absolutely, in my estimation, it's absolutely free. The wonderful people. You look stuff up really quickly. Is that the deal? Oh my God! I mean, I go instantly to the Hebrew. You can, you know, I, I can show you that uh, if you guys could look. I'm, we're going to go to First John, but I want to show you something in a very in a scripture that you guys know. I want to show you something. Let's go to Isaiah. Okay. Let's go to Isaiah mm -hmm. 26.3. How many people recognize that? Now, now, look, I'm on the Bible Hub. If you can see my screen, it's so easy. Which version? Okay. Which version? I'm on there. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you in a second. We're gonna, we're, this is a hands-on. I want you guys to... If you're interested, I'll show you how easy it is to study the Bible, even in other languages. Don't be intimidated. I am no Hebrew scholar. I never will be. I only study the languages to know and see Jesus. Remember, right. our number one principle 
right? We, there's an indispensable principle of Bible study, total reliance on the Holy Spirit. But what is our objective to see Jesus? Because when you see Jesus, you die. When you see Jesus, you die in a good way. His love right. surrenders you. His love surrenders your need to control, your need to protect yourself. You yield. You lay your head upon his breast as John did. You become receptive instead of aggressive. You become female instead of male. And maybe I'll show you that in, 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 in Proverbs and Genesis 11. Maybe. We'll see. But most of you guys know Isaiah, I'm on the wrong one. See, now if I'm 23, I go 24, 25, 26, right? Now, most of you guys know Isaiah 20, 6, 3. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. Those, now you go through, you got all these different translations. Do you guys see on my page? I got the New International I got, you know, the NIV, which is the funny joke, ah, ha, ha, nearly inspired version. They had to change it to make money. <laughs> Standard version, Berean study, King James. Oh. So I, I tell you, I like the Berean. I'll go to Berean. Okay. You will keep in perfect peace the steadfast of mind because he trusts in you. Now I hit three. Do you see what I'm doing? Okay. Now I've isolated the one verse. Now look up above, okay? You see where it says Hebrew? Yeah. I hit Hebrew, okay. Now what I'm also looking for is interlinear, and I don't see it, but uh, it's different on my phone. That's okay. Now, let's see it. Where's he starting it? I want you to see something. Uh, can you see here? What we call perfect peace, you see in the center here? Perfect peace. How many people know? I will keep you in perfect peace. Hundred songs written about it more. Right? Right. Look to the left. God repeats shalom, shalom. I'm going to go to the parallel of Hebrew, see if that works. Damn. Okay. Uh, this thing is really not working with me. What's going on? Interlinear. Come on. Perfect peace. It's not in the image that I get on my phone. What's going on here? I'm. Too many. Why is it like that? Oh, here it is. This is what I'm looking for. I'm sorry. Thank you. It's usually in the interlinear. What you see, interlinear, I N T E. Now, you got to understand, Hebrew reads from right to left, okay? Right. The one who's yet, sir, say yet, sir, yet, sir. Yet, sir, the one who's yet, sir, is stayed, fixed. We'll keep him in, do you see here? Shalom, shalom. Perfect peace. There's no perfect peace. It's shalom repeated twice. In Hebrew as in Greek, when a word is repeated twice, it's the perfection of the word. Going back to Revelation 1, when John falls at the feet of Jesus, Jesus lifts him up and says to him, never, ever, 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 never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever be afraid again. Because the never is repeated twice. Okay. Right. The perfect peace is shalom, shalom. That's why in Israel, and you see it, you probably experienced it, they say shalom, shalom. Because shalom is peace, but shalom, shalom is perfect peace. Okay. And, and I don't know if any of you guys, I, in the future, I'll have better technology, but can you see shalom here? Can anybody, can you see yeah. here? This yeah. is a shin, a lamid, a vav, and a yes, mem. I see it. You see that? You guys see that? Shalom, okay? Now, in Hebrew letters, 
If I just look at the letters, it says to destroy the strong leader connected to chaos. The mem represents the floodwaters of Genesis. The vav right here is a nail. Nail mm -hmm. means connected. The vav is the sixth letter. It's a nail, 666. 666 is how Jesus is nailed. Three vavs, three nails. It looks like a nail, doesn't it? Yeah. You see the lamid? Lamid is a shepherd's staff. It represents the leader or the shepherd. Many times it represents Jesus. But you got to understand, in Hebrew, each letter has a dark and a light side. God has to divide it. God speaks it, but when he says it's good and he looks at it, he divides it for you. And you see with his eyes. Keep your See, if you see with his eyes, then you see the difference between the light and the darkness of his words and his images. Now, if I take this vav out, this is shalom. This gives you the O sound, almost sometimes an O sound, the vav, the vav, right? The word shalem in Aramaic, I had a friend who studied Aramaic many years and we had a lot of fun together and a lot of deep studies. We believe, and don't send the Aramaic and Hebrew police to me. We uh -oh. believe that Jesus on the cross, we know he spoke Aramaic. Ask Mel Gibson, he'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> uh, that Jesus did not say, it is finished, as we know. He said, Salem. He said, Salem oh. without the Vav. Now, when he said, Shalem or Salem, the root word means to pay the bill in full. It has been canceled. Your debt is canceled. It has more of that feeling. It is finished. You get it? The debt is over. It's finished. Wow. They brought Salem. The bill is paid, which is a good feeling, right? But when you add the nail of Christ to it, now it becomes shalom and it becomes everything in Israel is shalom. Good morning, good night, peace, love. Perf you understand? Yeah. God nails that to you. You see the nail? It's connected to you. So the price being paid when nailed to you, the nail handwriting of ordinances against you was nailed to the cross. Now you have shalom, shalom. Now, let me just show you one thing about this word, yet sir, here. Yet, sir. Okay. Yet, sir, means imagination the mind there in the hebrew it really is talking about the imagination it's talking about a womb okay it's talking about a place where something grows a seed is planted and grows into reality and we call that imagination image right and the image comes forth now i want to just show you something bear with me i think we take a little uh, I, and i want this to be like i said i want to train you guys and you get interested in the word you can look it up here and you don't have to know this hebrew i, I you know I, I i can help you if some people are interested i love the letters i love finding christ in the letters and stuff but some people don't but if you do, this is how easy it is. Now, if we go to Genesis, here, it's easy it is to go to Genesis 11. In the beginning. No, not in 11. Now in 11. Oh, no, I, no, you were, okay, sorry. When, when, I, when we talk about Genesis 11, okay, we're talking about, uh, one way to remember that is the Tower of Babel. 
11 and the Tower of Babel, I usually think of the Twin Towers look like an 11 and how the, the Tower of Babel had to come down, right? Now, remember that this is a time when the people of the earth were joining together in rebellion to God. Okay. So they had one speech, it says here. Udebarim is one language. Okay. And what happened is that they, be, they, they, they imagined, okay, to build a tower and see, silly Christian teaching assumes or insinuates that the tower is going to reach up to heaven like, like heaven is like, you know, above us. Like, you know, we've got planes riding there. You know. mm-hmm. But the truth is that it was a ziggurat, okay? Not a Marlboro or a mental. <laughs> 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 Anybody know what a ziggurat is? Okay. It's uh, a temple to the gods. It is like a witch's coven. It is like a hexagram. It is a place to invoke, bring down the spirits. Like a portal? What? Like a portal? Thank you. Better word. Okay. The highness of it was the portal. Let us bring down. Now, people talk about that with the CERN, the whole thing and everything. I'm not going to get into it. There are these places on earth where people bring down the Elohim. Okay? The dark angels, the dark beings. Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers. Right? And so what they said they were going to do and let me go back to a regular translation because I know you guys are saying, what the hell is he talking about? Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so it said, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower that reaches the heavens, to the heaven, that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered. Okay. And where is it uh, that the Lord says about them, okay, that... Should they do this, anything they, anything they imagine, they'll make it real. They they can accomplish. Is that yeah. Twelve. Okay. Yeah. Back there. So here's the thing that I want to make a point to you is that these are biblical principles. God would have destroyed the temple and then confused the languages, which is what he did. See, what he did is, on the day of Pentecost, he reversed that. On the day of Pentecost, he took all these people speaking different languages, all understanding. So he confused them. He slowed them down, knowing that we as Christians have this power of the imagination, the Yetzer where we can make things occur. Now, we do that in our own lives. I just want to give you one example, and then we're going to move on to second, uh, we'll move on to second Corinthians uh, 10. This is a true story, a true scientific fact. They studied multiple personality disorder people, and I've actually been involved with healing them down in Maryland. I've met many of them, and let me tell you, Freaky deaky. Okay, serious stuff. A lot of them, a lot of demonic, a lot of demonic. I met people that would blow your mind. I was talking to this one guy who used to use two personalities when he was driving. One was driving the car and the other was reading a book. I'm not lying to you. I met them. Oh my gosh. When they did these scientific studies, they did people with as many as eight, nine personalities, but you never knew when they were going to pop up. This one person had one personality that was a drug addict. 
as soon as that personality, let's call him George, showed up, within minutes, he had track marks on his arms. And this is scientifically backed up. You can look it up. What flesh was changed. Skin was changed. What happens to you and me when we believe a lie? What are we doing to our bodies internally? What are we doing with our patterns? And what are the patterns doing to us? We want to break that. We want to break that. And that comes from fear. And that comes from... So, when, let me just tell you one thing. I, we, don't, we don't have time, and, and, and I don't know if you guys can handle it, but when I looked up, they said, let us make bricks, right? Now look at, can you see verse 3? So they used brick instead of stone. Who could, and tar instead of mortar. Okay. I did a study of it in Hebrew, and it's crazy. Why bricks instead of stone, guys? Brick is man-made. Stone is from God. The tar they made and they used was in the in the Hebrew was like a scum that came up. It was really the darkness and the fear, and it created in the Hebrew it, the word means a glue and a hardening agent. Today, if you hear my voice, harden not your hearts. The stuff inside of us becomes a hardening agent and we become hard hearted. That's why we need to be circumcised. Things have to be disciplined in us, right? And so this tower was going to be built on the thoughts and ideas and dreams of these people and on their sin and on their degradation and all of this rebellion. The Tower of Babel was going to be built on stubbornness and rebellion. And so there's one more thing I want to look at before we go to Second Corinthians. I want to look at Proverbs 18, guys. When I look, remember, we're looking at patterns. Book of Proverbs. Okay, uh, once again, how easy you go at Proverbs, you go here, you go 18, boom, get there. Okay, now I want you to look at a pattern, and we, we don't have time. This will be, you know, we'll get into this in the future. Hopefully, I can make more sense and more order out of it, but I'm just throwing stuff at you. Look at Proverbs 18, first verse. He who isolates himself pursues selfish desires and rebels against all sound judgment. I've done that. I was isolated for years. I got friends right now that isolate themselves as they pursue their selfish desire. They don't want correction. They don't That's want a circle of mirrors. They don't That's want you seeing their blind side. They don't want to be corrected. But, you know, it says the kisses of the enemy may be profuse, but faithful are the wounds of a friend. John, can I interject? Yes. Do that, just ki- that just killed a friend because he isolated, used, and died of a drug overdose. This fentanyl that's going around, I believe, is what did it. But that's yeah. what we do when we want to hurt ourselves because people that love us are not going to just sit by and watch it. Well, we that's why we're going to build, we're going to, by the grace of God, meet in circles of love, in circles where everybody 
Nobody is above anybody. Everybody is equally blessed with sin and bad habits and misunderstandings and hurts because our unity, which is what God wants in this end age. He, remember that Jesus said, they'll know when my people are one, echad, one. Okay. Mm. They'll know when we're one. And the only way we can become one is in our humanity. Christians are divided on their silly divinity ideas. Right. And Catherine, if I can uh, piggyback on that, I'm first. I'm sorry about your friend. I'm very sorry. Um, but it's it's okay. So we have the two things that motivate us: we have love and we have fear. And obviously, fear leads you to control your environment, which is what your friend was doing with with uh, with the addiction. But there's also another aspect to fear, and that's shame. Perhaps yes. this person was afraid to come out to be amongst people that that he might be judged. So shame um, is an, is another a sister of the fear and the control, and it's just an ugliness too. So he may have been suffering from that as well. Amen. Well, look at well, just look at a couple of these in eighteen. We're going to move on quickly. I want to wrap this up. Uh, number two. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in airing his opinion. Now, this is where I want to get to. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. It's not the Tower of Babel, which means, you know, Babel, the word Babel in, in Hebrew means mixed and confused. Hmm. God is not interested in mixing our opinions with his. He's interested in us agreeing with him. The name, remember, in the scripture, the name is the character of the Lord. The righteous run to it and are safe. But, number 11, a rich man's wealth is his fortified city. It is like a high wall in his imagination. Ooh, okay. You getting it? You yeah. It? Now, I don't have time. Maybe we're going to have, like, I'm going to eventually do things in two sections. They're going to be. Right, deep, but this, this, the imagination, this is a construct that we create. He built a wall. I get it. It's making sense. Yeah. And let me tell you something. The word high wall in Hebrew is a feminine wall. Really? Now, anytime you deal with this masculine and feminine, which gives you indications towards meaning. And I see that as the church, the bride of Christ. Now, the funny thing is, okay, the word is based on a root word, which really means her husband's father. So what, what's interesting is, is that the people that trust in their wealth, okay, they're creating a wall, but they've gone away from the root. The root is to be connected to in relation to your husband's father let me ask this question and you, you're going to get a lollipop if you get it right <laughs> who's our husband's father god, god father god the father right i want jesus. my lollipop chocolate jesus is the bridegroom jesus is the the husband. Bride. right the father and I see that in Hebrew letters. I don't have time to show it to you. That's unbelievable. The stuff is so deep. God has hidden all his mysteries and secrets in there. But you see, when you read that, a rich man's wealth, don't think only money. Money is part of it. Intelligence, good looks, fortunate birth, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
These are the strongholds. And we imagine God loves us too much to let us trust. This is a song from my Trust in the Lord blues song. He loves us too much to let us trust illusions that deceive. God wants you to see reality. That's why Jesus said to the woman at the well, don't give me this religious faulty wrong. Don't give me religious fake crap. Religion. Yeah. He says, because the time is coming and now is when the Father is looking for a new type of worshiper. One who worships in spirit. I said this a million times, I'll say it a million more. And reality. It says spirit and truth. The Greek is much better interpreted spirit and reality. Okay. If you see how Jesus healed her, he healed her by telling her the reality of her life. It wasn't pleasant. It was the faithful wound of a friend. Mm. Nicely put. Yeah. So, so in Second Corinthians 10, we go to. So now you know. Let me see. I don't know if I like this translation. Let's see what we got. And this is the thing. Now look if I go up into this Bible thing here on my right. You see what I'm hitting? Watch this. This is all the translations available to you. <laughs> look at this. It's insane. And this is all free. Anytime you want. So he says, okay, for the weapons of all warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I've told you, I'll tell you again, the word strongholds there is the Greek word akaroma, and it means a mind set. That's the bricks that the Tower of Babel was built on. Our mindsets. When your mind is set, you have to repent. That means change your mind. They are now the houses we live in. You said that. Got to burn You're them right. down. That's it. That's it. Now look at five. Casting down imaginations. What are imaginations? Presumptions. What are presumptions? Traditions that have become hard with with the hardening agent of, of what's inside of you. Fear is the hardening agent. And we trust in it. You, you've seen people are OCD. That's it taking it to the level where it, it, it's controlling them. They had to wash their hands 19 times before right. 12 o'clock. For noon. Right. They are addicted and imprisoned by trying to control their fear. And it's only by dying in the arms of a loving God, a God who loves us. We're going to finish with that, First John, who loves us. And that's why knowing God through Jesus Christ is the only way. Because we cannot we cannot fathom a God who burps universes. How do you talk to God who knows every, he, he knows every blade of grass on your lawn by name. There's 200 billion galaxies, 200 billion stars in each galaxy. It says he names them all. It's hard to relate yeah, a little. What, what subject would you like to bring up with that guy? <laughs> Jesus Christ is the only mediator. God became a man. God became a man. So casting down the weapons of our warfare, they're not in the flesh. It's not psychology. It's not Xanax. 
It's mighty through God to the pulling down of your imaginations, your strongholds, the things that are holding you in a pattern of unbelief, unsuccess, and the enemy doesn't care what you say with your mouth, contrary to what you might have been taught. He cares what you do. See, mm. God said, let there be light. But when he saw it, he pronounced it good. When you see it, you'll pronounce it good, you see. And every high thing, now what is the high thing? It exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We have to know God, and the way to do that is in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay, Lord, you're making me do it. He just said, go to four. All right, I'll do it. Go, guys, go to 2 Corinthians 4, then we'll hit 3. We'll probably end it on this. Like some, I got a hundred other things to share. It's okay. <laughs> now, I want you to see this. Wait, you see. I want you to see how this fits now. I want you to see how this fits. Okay. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, 2 Corinthians 4, one, we faint not because we receive mercy. You see, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, uh, 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 reality. We renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, Jacob, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, you false teachers. But by manifestation of what? The truth. We're Reality. To every man's conscience. The conscience is given to you by God. In the Bible, the soul is considered to be what? I call it the, the web. The will, the emotion, and the brain. We call it, right? Oh, right. Okay. I, I call it the web because it creates a spider web in us. That's the soul. But everybody's soul, mind, emotion, and will, right? Mm hmm When the Bible says your heart, the heart of a man, it's his soul plus one thing from God, conscience. Read Romans 2. And Paul says that every man's conscience, whether they heard the gospel or not, whether they knew God or not, their conscience bearing witness, either, you know, either condemning or, you know, or excusing them. Say the conscience is the law of God in you. It means to know it's an attribute of the spirit, not of the soul. So it becomes four parts. Our heart has four parts. How many people know that your heart has four chambers? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mind, emotion, and will, and conscience. That's the law of God that every man knows. And he either obeys it, submits, or denies it, puts his fingers in his ears like the Pharisees with Stephen, and says, my heart is not plucked. But Jesus said, your heart was plucked. But I guess what? I'll give you, you didn't believe my words. But look at my deeds. You see? You want to ignore my words? Let there be light? Look what I did. It's good. You see it. You saw my deeds. See us? You heard? You didn't believe? You saw it. You're condemned. Say, right. Every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our, listen to this, if our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. 
lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, come on people, who is the image of God, what? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, your slaves, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on. Come on. You see? And so, one more scripture so I can close it up. Uh, one more scripture since it's so easy now for you guys to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at 1 John 3, 2. All right. All right. Behold what manner of love, 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, sons of men. It does not yet appear what we shall be, son of man. But we do know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Now, why is that, John? Who's 90 to 100 when he wrote this? When he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall shall see him as he is. And verse 3, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. We love you know, we do it on Sundays. If you guys are interested, 11 o'clock, we do Center of Prayer together. Uh, Tina and I do, try to do it every day. I've been trying to do it every day since God told me to do it in 2008. I gaze at the invisible face of Christ. I don't have a picture of Christ. I don't think of Christ. I'm looking into the face of his spirit. I'm letting him love me. Because the definition of love, you know, when God told me, John, you've been trying to love me your whole life and you're not good at it, in case you haven't noticed. He said, and all you really need to do is let me love you. And I said, show me the scripture. I, I Look, I challenge God on everything he says. Because he wants me to. I said, give me the scripture. What are you talking about? He says, you don't, You just have to live in response to my love. You, you've been trying to get me to love you, which is dumb because I already do. You've been trying to show off and think I love you more, which is even duller. Because <laughs> you are a clown. <laughs> now, he, he goes like, boom, in my, in, right in my spirit. First John 4.10, boom. Well, can you get a better can you get a better confirmation? Here is love. Now wait a minute. That's an announcement. Here is love. Not that we love God. <clears throat> oh. 
here is love. Not that we loved God. Is your love of God based on your love? You're powerless. You're up and down. You're a roller coaster. That's the devil's own trick. Here is love. Not that you love God, but he loved us. How? Sending his son to be the atoning sacrifice. That's what propitiation means. It means shalem. The price is propitiated. It is satisfied, satiated. It is over. It is finished. It's done. Now you get that. That love originates to him, to you. And you react to that if you sit in it. Then, beloved, verse 11, if God so loved us, hello, we ought to love one another. <laughs> 12, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. His love is matured in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. As Paul writes the down payment. And we have seen, seen, you get in the scene, you get in the vision, the looking. Mm. We see it's good, it gets divided. And we have seen and do testify. Wait a minute. We saw first, then testified that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Well, I got nothing else to say, guys. <laughs> I can't, I can't compete with that. Can't compete. You burnt, with that, but yeah, you burned it up. Yeah, uh, can't go. Yeah, we just got to sit in that, rest in that, and. Uh, I don't know who's on because my, my uh, <laughs> go to meeting is working, but uh, I will open it up if anybody wants to share something. God said something. God showed you something. Okay, I promise you I'm shutting up. I just thought of a song when you were before. Oh, is anybody else sharing? <laughs> I was going to. Sing of uh, behold what manner of love the Father has given us to us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That's it. I'm not going to sing anymore. <laughs> oh, man, that was beautiful. <laughs> well, just uh, correlates with what John shared. That's all. Mm. Mm. John, did you record that? I might want to go back and listen to that one again. Yes, I'm recording them all, thank God. But, you know, we're going to yeah. dissect it. I'll have it up on YouTube by tomorrow, so it'll be available. That, that's good. I mean, you're kind of rapid fire, but that's your style, and that's kind of cool. But it's, it, it's, it's difficult to take notes like that. Yeah. I like to um, take notes. That's just the way I do it. But no, I mean. Yeah, you know, in, in, in the future, I, I'll talk, tell people, like, because we want to move in, like, the spirit. We want to kind of have, because yeah. I, didn't, I didn't plan this. I put down a couple of things. Usually it, it happens. God is showing me scriptures as soon as I mention something. And I want it to be spontaneous. I want it to be anointed. And we want to experience the Lord. Uh, so. By recording it, if somebody wanted, they can always, you know, go over it piece by piece, which I would love for people to do. But like I said, right. uh, we don't want to put any pressure. Sometimes it's just good to, you know, get into it and let's just bounce all over the scripture and see how the Old Testament and the New Testament is one book of the light and love of God. And, yeah. And, He's dividing our lives. He's giving us spiritual eyes. Don't believe. Remember what Jesus said. I can't stop. I can't stop. <laughs>
Because Jesus said, you know, it came, the Pharisees came and said, are you telling us we're blind? Yes. He, he was. And, and what was Jesus' response? Jesus' response was, if you were blind, you would see. Right. But because you say, you say. You see. You see, once again, the juxtaposition, saying and seeing. Job mm -hmm. said, I had heard of you, but right. now I see you. God speaks, but then brings it into reality by looking at it and calling it good. But because you say you see, your blindness remains. And we know he's talking about the difference between seeing with the eyes of the flesh and the eyes of the spirit. Everyone, oh, there goes my, everyone John, has the eyes of the spirit. Yes, this reminds me way back when you were talking about quantum physics and the fact that when the, the scientists, when they see something and they observe it, light, the light waves, yes, they become particles about paying, the act of paying attention to seeing something. Right. And God, you know, well, that's, yeah, well, it's that's a pattern. Great. It's a pattern. Yes, thank you. I don't want to get too deep because, you know, people tell me, don't get too deep in physics and all that stuff. But you said it perfectly. It's very simple. It's so simple. important because it's a scientific fact that atoms and electrons exist hey, differently. In, right. If you pay attention well, to them, they exist in wave form in a potential that can't be mapped. But when you look at them, they're solid. All of a sudden, God they're particles. So God gazed at the light and solidified it. Right. His gaze makes it real. And so we have to be careful, guys. The warning is watch out what you're looking at. You might have some speckled goats and sheep come out of you. Exactly. And that's the power of your imagination, too. It's all connected. What you're looking at. And if the See? blind lead the blind, they both go into the ditch. So let us pray for each other as Paul prayed. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Amen. I also wanted to. Oops! I also wanted to say um, that God gazes at us, that we exist. Yeah. Yes. Right. Amen yes, to that. Amen. And that's, thank you, Tina, because, and that's the essence of what we try to experience in Centering Prayer, is God gazing at us, and in that sense, calling us good, and and holding us together nanosecond by nanosecond, so that we can relax and not hold ourselves. And the fear will dissipate. Now... Whoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, verse 15, 1, 4, God dwells in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God, God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, which means mature. Here is, is our love made to fulfill its destiny. When you see the word perfect, put in the words, fulfill its destiny. Character building. Here is our love fulfilling its destiny. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world, sons of man. As he is, there is no fear in love. But fear that has reached its destiny casts out fear. Because fear has torment. He that fears has not reached their full destiny, the destiny and purpose of God in love. And we love him. And, and God says, I maybe read this. I'm sorry. We love him <laughs> because, because 
because because he first loved us. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Continue to let him first love you. Amen. Beautiful. I'm going to end on that. I'm not going to do any more. Good night, everybody. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! All right. Great way to end, John. I love it. He first loved me. I have to Amen. let that. Amen. What scripture was that? I, I, I didn't scroll up in time. It's not there anymore. What scripture is that? That's 1 John 4, 19. 4, 19. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night, guys. Thanks, John. Good night.